The land of Israel is a land of incredible geographic complexity. I'm Jack Beck. I'm a Bible geographer, and I'm here in the Holy Land in order to explore all the geographical differences that this land has to offer. And I'm doing it as a Bible teacher because in order to best understand our Bible and the stories that only fit in the places that they occur, we're gonna go on a trip that visits all sorts of different places in this region. Now that Mount Hermon is in our rear view mirror, we're following the Jordan River Valley south to another geographic region, the Galilee. I am going to show you a way of thinking about and reading your Bible you may never have experienced before. We're gonna make the Bible's geography meaningful. Many of us hear the label Galilee and we think inland lake, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, but the Galilee is actually a more complicated environment than that. And we're gonna start in Western Lower Galilee. Uh, Western Lower Galilee is a land of ridges and valleys of farmland and grapevines. It's an amazing place. But no matter where you are in Galilee, whether lakeside or mountainside, if you're from Galilee, most considered you to be from a real backwater place, a long, long way from Jerusalem. I'm standing between two very different worlds. This is the Jezreel Valley. It's open, it's international, lying just south of the region of Galilee. You know what I'm always surprised by? How very quickly this land changes over short distances coming up just 1,100 feet and moving one half a mile inward, I come to Nazareth. Nazareth is closed. It's local. And if you were from here, you were a nobody. The prophecy in Isaiah 53 says, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. This is describing Jesus. His hometown was Nazareth, off the grid, isolated from the world. The population consisted of maybe a dozen families. And please realize, there was no Jewish expectation that the Messiah would come from here. Today, the core of Nazareth has grown to more than 100,000 residents most of them are Arab families that hold Israeli citizenship. To get a better understanding of what the Nazareth of Jesus' time looked like, I'm here at the Nazareth Village. It's a living outdoor museum reconstructed on first century ruins, complete with homes and donkeys and terraced fields. Jesus spent over two decades of his life here. Now this is Nathaniel, a tour guide who teaches visitors about village life in Nazareth and how this environment shaped Jesus. So Nathaniel, if I would, could dial myself back in time, right? Hop in a time machine and step into this place and walk next to Jesus for a while, what would, what would a day look like? What, what might he do throughout the day, every day? So, um, because we think that uh, Nazareth, we don't really know historically a lot about Nazareth. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably a really small place yeah. in a farming area. So, subsistence farming would be kind of the everyday, you know, like sure. we talked about sheep, like the trees and sure. grapes and what have you. So, a typical day, probably waking up with the sun, right? Um, eating a light meal together. Okay. Uh, the women are already beginning the day preparing food and the men going out to the fields to do, to do the everyday kind of labor, or in the case of Jesus and his father Joseph, of course, their workshop, um, and then work all day, uh, and then come home probably as the sun was setting. They probably packed a lunch, or if they were harvesting, they would eat whatever they were harvesting, and then uh, come back, have a light meal. In this humble setting, the working class community of Nazareth anchored their lives in the synagogue because they were observant Jewish people. 
Here we are in a replica of a first century synagogue. Very cool. Pretty unique building. Of course, we found the remains of other synagogues from the first century, mm -hmm. and the design and the materials, everything is inspired by those places. And there's some features that, um, that are common to first century synagogues. Okay. One of the keys to this is, of course, the name, Synagoge in Greek ah. and Beit Knesset in Hebrew, mm. uh, both mean the house of gathering. Mm -hmm. And so we believe that it functioned more like a community center. Interesting. Uh, and so we think whatever uses were necessary for the community, uh, some people suggest that maybe even functioned like a school, uh, ah. certainly uh, a courthouse. You know what you just said? I, I, a light bulb went on, right? The last verse in Luke chapter 2 says Jesus grew in stature, so he matured physically, and then it said he grew in wisdom. So in a place like this, he might learn to read and write and study his history and, mm -hmm. and theology, is that right? If this was an educational place, this is where Jesus would learn too, right? Absolutely. They were amazed at his wisdom and at his ability to understand and, and the kinds of questions that he was asking. Yeah. You live and work and breathe this space that, that, that represents the, the village Jesus was in. He lived for, for at least a couple of decades in this space and then left. And by my take, he only came back once uh, that, that, that we know about. What did he take from here, from this valley, to those who are outside this valley? Well, life, the, the simple life, the common life, you know, growing up as a normal person, you know, with mm. farmers and as a workman. His life was very quiet, very pastoral. And we see that in how he teaches. He connects with the common people. Uh, you know, the illustrations are for everyday life in Jesus' teaching. Yeah, he, he's, he doesn't step off of the, the throne and come down. He, he's been living, right, in this right. space among the most ordinary of ordinary folks. You know, I'm always struck by the fact that this place is unmentioned in the Old Testament. It's, it's unmentioned in the first century writings of Josephus, and it's unmentioned in the Jewish traditional writings. It's like the, it's really hard to hit all three of those, to be missed in all three of those. Uh, this little community that's tucked down in this valley seems to be out of sight of everybody. Yeah, it seems that if Jesus didn't come from Nazareth, then probably would have never heard of Nazareth, perhaps. Maybe even the Romans didn't even know of Nazareth. It was not an important population center. It was not an, any important trade route. Uh, again, as we, sort of Norwellsville, you know, it's not, it's not an important place. And yet, perhaps by the divine perspective, it's the perfect place. You know, as you said, you know, a kind of cocoon, a special, a special place that way. How could the Messiah come from here, a place of weakness and low expectation? 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 28 says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. God's ways are not our ways. Nazareth sheltered Jesus and gave him the tools he would need to connect with the outside world. One of the followers of Jesus once said, hey, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Turns out, the greatest good the world had ever seen did. <laughs>